I've got Ruben Espinosa in the house. We're going to talk about the bard, the border, Shakespeare, Latinx identity, and culture. Welcome, Ruben. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Thanks for having me and inviting me. And yeah, honored to be with you. This is great. So, so cool. And you're, you're um, piping in from UTEP uh, right now. I'm so excited. You know, there you've got the desert and here we have, well, we got winter, we got snow. Um, but tell me, um, you know, you, there was a little bit, there was a little bit of a moment where we had a crossover in Colorado and then you ended up going to El Paso with your PhD in hand. And, uh, but how in the world, tell, I want everybody to know how your path led to Shakespeare and then from Shakespeare to issues of race and gender, immigration, gender, Latinidad. Tell us everything, Ruben. <laughs> All right. I, I promise to be, to be candid here. I've, I've been promising myself, you know, more candor when it comes to these issues. Uh, just, you know, uh, really kind of embracing the, the strategies of critical race studies. I, you know, I like it. Like most people, my, my first uh, interaction with Shakespeare was in high school, you know, freshman year, Romeo and Juliet. Um, and my junior year, uh, one of our English teachers showed us the film Dead Poet Society. And like many in my generation, at least for us geeks who were interested in literature, it, it was a, a kind of compelling, you know, movie. And, and you know, in, in that movie, one of the characters, Neil, auditions for Midsummer Night's Dream that year. They had auditions for Midsummer Night's Dream in, in, in my high school. I auditioned. I didn't get the part of Puck like him, uh, but I, I got the part of Oberon. And that was really my first interaction with Shakespeare. Nothing, nothing interesting about that aside from, you know, looking at, 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 at wanting to, you know, like a, a, a literary figure, right, that I, like many, didn't really quite understand. I mean, quite frankly, right? But he seemed to be the, the kind of face of literature, right? If you love literature, you should love Shakespeare. Uh, and taking that for granted was something I did for, for a long, long time thereafter. Looking back on it now, it's interesting to see how a Chicano in a you know, school with an 80% Chicanx population, you know, or a city, uh, and you know, being exposed to a movie that that is really the epitome of whiteness, right? These these kids are are in private institution here, right? Going to school, embarking on you know, loving literature from the canon, and really just all these white authors. And so, that path, I have to say, was maintained. I never questioned it. I, I kind of went forward. I, I did love Shakespeare. I loved the language. Everything I loved about literature was in Shakespeare later in life. And so. You know, I do think, you know, my, my gravitation to gender studies was because of the seeming resistance to these, you know, paradigms of, of oppression with women. And I had not yet, I think, tapped into my own apprehensions, my own feelings of oppression until looking backward. And so that, that was it. I was lucky to work with Catherine Agard, who's, you know, brilliant, I think, you know, and, and her work in, in gender studies and Shakespeare's is, is, is remarkable at, at Colorado. And, you know, she gave me a sense of confidence. And I, I remember once, you know, I, I was already on the market and she was describing my work and she said, you know, you're, you're, you're a bit of an iconoclast. And, you know, I, I felt like I, I never really thought about my work that way. And that is, you know, something that stuck with me going forward. And once I returned to El Paso, um, I have to admit, I finished the book, it got published. And then suddenly there was a moment, you know, where I'm at the, our major Shakespeare Association of America conference. You know, I'm excited because it's the first time it's going to be on display, the book, right, in the, in the book exhibit. And I go in there and I see it and then I look around and it was just a moment where I thought, like, who, who am I writing for? Like, what am, I, what am I doing, right? And it was after that, I think I did a little soul searching and I, you know, looking at a wall that had already been built here in El Paso as a symbol of inhospitality, you know, we got to talking about issues of hospitality with a colleague of mine. And so we, we put together the proposal for Shakespeare and Immigration. And, and that changed um, my career, quite frankly. I mean, I, I met scholars who contributed to that who were working on critical race studies. Uh, Peter Erickson in particular, Imtiaz Abib, who, who recently passed. And it, it changed, you know, the way I thought about Shakespeare and specifically about the historically oriented work that was dominating our field and the way that we could think about it outside of those historical contexts, right? And that that um, just got the ball rolling. Met Ayanna Thompson, whose work has been, you know, kind of field defining uh, when it comes to critical race studies. And and that's been it, you know, since I, I, I really 
embraced it and I feel a sense of purpose in the work. And, you know, quite frankly, there, there's not a lot of engagement, you know, with Latinx and Shakespeare, at least that are visible, right? I mean, it always mm. seems to be marginalized, you know, uh, not, certainly not major productions. And, and so that's been interesting to kind of uncover and to look for those moments of intersection to Shakespeare and, and Latinidad. I love that your um, that popular culture kind of was the trigger for you. There's so many instances too. Um, you know, I think of these, you know, those, um, I don't know, like the substitute and, you know, um, dangerous uh, minds, you know, with Michelle Pfeiffer and those moments when like, you know, the kids, the, the dangerous kids, the Latinx, the brown and black BIPOC kids are like enlightened because of this moment with Shakespeare or something, right? <laughs> Yeah, right, right. Yeah, no, I'm so glad you brought that up. Also, I was thinking about Arturo Islas, of course, and he spent time at UTEP um, writing this La Mali and the King of Tears. And there's a moment um, where you have the bard and the border and the Chicanex, right? Mm -hmm. um, so much, so much intersect, so much going on in my head here. Do you want to tell us like, about this work? Um, so, you know, Masculinity, the Marian Efficacy in Shakespeare's England, 2011. And then this one, this really important Shakespeare in immigration, as you said, like really kind of a paradigm shift for you that came out in 2014. Um, can you drill in a little bit for us on these? Uh, yeah, of course. So, yeah, my, my work on, on the Virgin Mary was, you know, came from, again from a place of thinking about the way that her figure was was deployed in early modern literature, not not just Shakespeare, right, but, but a lot of the polemics of the period to define, you know, aspects of masculinity and, and she's an interesting figure because she survives the reformation you know where reverence for saints you know shifts a little bit and you know she they have to continue to believe in in aspects of her character right that that are not found in scripture and that that belies everything that you know Luther and Zwingli and Calvin were, were, were drawing on, right? And so, you know, for me, she was an interesting figure in terms of shifting from Catholic reverence to Protestant reverence or irreverence, right? Uh, and the way that, um, you know, certain writers would, would engage with her figure, engage with that reverence uh, in ways of kind of interrogating, right, what it means to be, you know, a man, right, what it, what it means to be a masculine nation, uh, with a with a queen with a female monarch right um, and so I think they're negotiating anxieties uh, through her and it, it was an interesting project I mean I, again you know I my interest in, in gender studies was firmly in place um, and what I became what I became interested in throughout that process was looking at saints lives and the violation of saints right the, the stories of martyrs so when I shifted to Shakespeare and immigration uh, which is a book that looks at both, you know, historical ways of thinking about immigration in early modern London, but also the way that contemporary, you know, current uh, day understandings of immigration and anti-immigrant sentiments, you know, infuse our understandings of Shakespeare in, a, in novel ways. Uh, and, it, you know, the, 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 con the contri contributions to that, that collection uh, are buried in, in this regard. And that, that came out of a lot of the work, you know, that, that I did in my first book and thinking about how an ethics of hospitality, you know, was either embraced or eschewed when thinking about the Virgin Mary. And so I became interested in that, in saints' lives. I come to Shakespeare and Immigration. Even my contribution to that book is historically situated in thinking about, you know, a Welsh character in, in Henry V, right, who resists, you know, the anti-immigrant sentiments. He actually fights back physically. Uh, and it's, it's a, I, a, from my perspective, an important moment to thinking about, you know, how linguistic identity in particular, right, that's, that's how he's mocked in that play, right, and this is why he resists that. Um, you know, I, it carries over into our present moment, right? have all of these ideas in mind. I, I, I'm here. And one day I'm speaking to Ayanna Thompson, who works very much, her work is firmly situated in popular culture of the present moment, right? And these kind of present day cultural artifacts and the way they intersect with Shakespeare and race. And she's asking, what's, what's your next project? And I'm telling her, I'm, I'm thinking of doing something on saints' lives and vulnerable bodies, right? And, and as a way to think about the violation of black and brown bodies in our present moment. And her response could not have been more straightforward. She's like, well, why don't you just write about the violation of black and brown lives in our present moment. Like, why, why do you need to use that as a vehicle, right, to, to talk about it, you know, in the historical past and instead focus on the historical present? And, you know, it just, there's something switched there. And I, I think, you know, that that ever since has been, has been my, my, my focal point in really thinking about 
how we can draw on these examples, you know, from our present moment. You, you bring up Arturo Islas. I think that's that's an important, you know, such an important figure in thinking about Latinx encounters in Shakespeare because he his all of that apprehensions of of of, of Louis, right? His his uh, protagonist in that in that novel. Uh, it surrounds his linguistic identity, right? Which, you know, from, from the perspective of Antaldu, right, it's twin skin to ethnic identity. And, and here, here you have, I think, the heart of it because Shakespeare, you know, figures so prominently in that novel in terms of the character, but you can also see Arturo Islas in the backdrop. I feel like really negotiating what he's been made to feel about his own Latinx identity as a writer, right? That you don't quite belong, that you're not quite mainstream and brilliantly showing us like... Uh, I can engage with probably the most iconic of white dead male authors, right? As any of you, as a scholar, as a writer. And those are the moments where I think to myself, this, this, if we're going to do anything to make Shakespeare important for, for, you know, a Latinx audience, this has to be it. They have to see themselves in the work. They have to kind of see the way the work, you know, reflects their experiences and their identities. And that's been what I've been trying to uncover in my research and in my work. And, you know, and, and that's, that's the way I, I arrived here. Wow, so important, so powerful. I bet uh, we're going to get there in a minute, but oh my goodness, I wish I had had you as my teacher of Shakespeare in college, Ruben. Um, Okay, this is just coming up around the corner, Shakespeare on the Shades of Racism. And I couldn't be more excited about this book. Um, And you kind of started to reach into this in your last kind of discussion, the last moment here, we were talking about time and space travels um, and into these kind of excavatings of new intersectional spaces um, and Latinidades um, today. Tell us about Shakespeare on the shades of racism. Yeah, so this this is a uh, um, I'm I'm excited about this book honestly, and, and not least of which because I, I was you know able to to write a lot of this uh, during what has been for many of us right the most difficult period you know uh, in, in depression uh, dealing with this pandemic. Um, you know, uh, the idea for this book preceded the the global pandemic, and I, I was invited by the series editors, uh, um, John Garrison and Kyle Pavetti, to to work on something, you know, uh, addressing race. And this is a cool series. Spotlight on Shakespeare is not looking for a kind of strictly academic, you know, it, it should be accessible. It's something that is, you know, uh, they're, they're looking to 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 really kind of see the way Shakespeare can 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 be imagined right through contemporary issues, events, right, and, and really kind of focus on those two to make us think about that. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I began writing this with the idea of, of, you know, what John Marquez calls, you know, the, the, the possibility for a praxis of solidarity between uh, Blacks and Latinxes. And, and the reason is because there, there's a, a rich and vibrant body of work um, that, that already exists looking at, at you know, African-American engagement with Shakespeare in the present moment, in the recent past, in, you know, the previous centuries. And so there's not a lot on Latinx engagement with Shakespeare. And like many things, you know, I, I, I feel it, it, it offers us a way to think about how we can, we can focus on, on these experiences, what, what Marquez calls experiences of expendability and exploitability for Blacks and Latinxes without conflating the histories of these individuals, right? I mean, that, that's not at all the point, right? But thinking about we are working within the same systems of oppression when it comes to white supremacy, right? So how can we rethink the way that Shakespeare has been mobilized, utilized for these anti-racist efforts, right? And, and that is the heart of this of this book. And so I'm, I'm looking at, at, at different experiences, uh, different issues surrounding anti-Blackness, surrounding anti-immigrant sentiments, uh, pressures of assimilation, uh, you know, in, in this vein, and, and really thinking about not what Shakespeare can teach us about those issues, but instead how these issues stand to infuse the meaning of his works, you know, with, 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 with greater valence, right, in, in, in our present moment. And um, so that, that you know, um, it, it, I, I mentioned at the start, I've, I've been trying to focus on being more candid in my own experiences, and it really has allowed me to, to think about, you know, the, the weight of, you know, what, what, to borrow from Baldwin, right, the weight of whiteness, right, in our society and how that particular pressure just, you know, defines so many of our experiences and what happens when we are able to really interrogate that, really interrogate that white supremacy head on. So 
um, it's a shift for me. I, I'm not looking necessarily, you know, for the moments of the, you know, black characters in Shakespeare or, you know, these, these moments of race in Shakespeare, but instead looking at whiteness and these, 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 these moments of white supremacy and the monstrosity surrounding that and being very honest about those dangers because we see that happening now. I mean, I, I think, I think the greatest danger in our present moment is precisely that. I mean, the kind of, um, mobilizing of white supremacy, right? Um, what was interesting though was, you know, I'm working on this, I'm trudging through it in the early parts of the pandemic, which is very difficult, you know, for, for all of us, I think, to focus. And then, you know, the events of June happened with George Floyd. And it was a moment where I, I, I either one, I went, you know, had to start all over from scratch and reimagine the book or continue on. And I decided to do the latter and include an afterward to acknowledge that and to, you know, think about how that incident, right, and how what we have been really wanting for such a long time, right, widespread protests and real, you know, anger surrounding this kind of blatant police killings of unarmed black men and women, right, in our society. And, and to see that, you know, to see that incident and to see the reaction to that, I think, you know, for, for so many of us was, was heartening in a way of thinking people finally are getting it, right. Uh, but I am eager to see coming out of this, right, how how this is going to affect the academy, right? How, how we are going to respond either in a sustained way or my hope is it's not just yet another incident here, right? That we see, look at it, and then move on, right? Mm -hmm. Monstrosity, um, uh, of course, you know, of, I'm thinking here, you mentioned monstrosity and um, I'm thinking Caliban, of course. Um, you mentioned white supremacy, and I'm thinking Ariel and Prospero. But um, that's me in a really naive, simplistic kind of way. Maybe you can um, take, you know, talk about whiteness and the illegitimate borders and black and brown bodies and in other of your work or in the work that we just talked about. Hey, I'm not going to let you be self-effacing here. I've, I've read your work on Shakespeare, and you, you've got a keen, keen view of it. So no, uh, I mean that—that's one way to look at it. I mean, certainly Caliban comes to mind, and and I, I think uh, you know he, uh, in many ways, is is engaging what what the energies that I I am interested in. You know, when, when he says, you know, you taught me language, and and you know my, you know what I've learned from it is how to, how to curse, you know, and curse at you. And so th there is an ownership there, right? But there's also the, the kind of devastating reality of his continued oppression from the start throughout and to the end. I mean, you know, when Prospero says, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine, uh, you know, it, it is a continued ownership of that. And so th those are, you know, that, that's, that's one, uh, I think, very, very explicit way of thinking about it. But, you know, there, there are undercurrents here in a play like Merchant of Venice where Portia, helps to sustain, you know, uh, the white supremacy in that particular play. She exhibits, you know, very, very explicit anti-blackness in that, in that, in that play. And so that for me is, is one play we can, we can examine and think about, but, but also in less obvious ways, you know, Peter Erickson has done some work on Hamlet and whiteness that I think is interesting. And, and Ian Smith, another scholar has, has worked on, you know, commented on, on Hamlet and the gravitation toward Hamlet and the way that a lot of academics, you know, want to tell a story, but don't want to tell a story like the Thalos, even though both of them say at the end, right, you know, it, you know, Hamlet says, report me and my cause, uh, you know, Thalos says, speak of me as I am, right, he, he also wants the audience, but we're unwilling, right, to really engage and to think about, you know, how to articulate the story of, of a black experience, and, and it's easier to kind of evade race and racism, right, and suggest that Hamlet is a universal figure. And he's not. I mean, and that, that's where I think, you know, thinking about the borders of black and brown bodies is an interesting dynamic, right? Because when you have something like, you know, um, Hamlet's to be or not to be speech, for example, here, right? As something iconic like that, there's a vivid difference when that is spoken by a white actor versus a black actor. And the public, uh, you know, New York capitalized on that this, this summer. They, they put out a video where that, um, that soliloquy was read by 30 black actors, right? And, you know, it's, it's a kind of wonderful production. Uh, Strange Fruit is playing in the background, right? And, you know, it comes, it comes to the fore at the end of, of the soliloquy. But, you know, it, it is this moment to think about, you know, the exhaustion of existence, right? And, and that's, that's what, what Hamlet is getting across, and that's how we've been taught to read it and think about it. But when we think about the exhaustion of existence for black men and women, right, it's different. And when I think about that, you know, 
also with, with Latinx identities in mind, you know, that there, there is this sense of, you know, illegitimate, illegitimacy takes on a much different force. So in King Lear, for example, right, when, when you know, you have uh, Edgar uh, thinking about, Edmund thinking about, about uh, illegitimacy here, right, you know, and, and he's a bastard, that sense of unbelonging, right, kind of carries a significant weight when we think about those words spoken by, by uh, a Latinx actor. And so I'm eager to see productions like this. Unfortunately, they, they, they are not mainstream, right? You know, when we, when we go to watch films, right, it is the whiteness of Shakespeare on display, even in, in, in attempts to create a multicultural cast like Boz Lerman's Romeo plus Juliet, you still fall into the paradigms of, of, you know, uh, views of, of Latinxes as violence, right? Where, you know, the kind of white Montagues, those kids, right, are whole Hawaiian shirt wearing kind of innocuous, you know, uh, 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 experiences, you know, with, with gun toting white kids. Whereas when they focus on the Latinxes like John Leguizamo, I mean, he's a force to be reckoned with. He, he presents real, real kind of, you know, danger. And so I, I'm interested also in the way that Shakespeare is being imagined in, in, in contemporary productions and novelistic, you know, designs and short films like, like the public and, you know, to see how can we rethink this, right? And how can we make this, you know, a speak to, to uh, what is important. And, and for me here, and I'll pass on I mean, that that's vividly important. I mean, we, we went through a period where, you know, the, 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 the crisis here, right. For, for immigrants and for, for those seeking asylum was, was horrific. I mean, you know, we, 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 my students were walking over the bridge, right? Where right under that bridge, you know, brown individuals were being caged like animals, you know, kept outdoors. It was, it was awful. And, you know, the, the, the child detention centers are here. And so, you know, I, 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 it has to, like I said earlier, I, it has to hold meaning. And for me, those, mm. those are the important things. I mean, and, and so this book, you know, I have a chapter that looks at, at children, right? And children in Shakespeare and the, the violence against children in Shakespeare. And really having us think about you know, why why this matters in our present moment, right? And why there is seeming indifference, right, to to you know what is transpiring here. And and it feels like that. I know that it's not. I know there are many people who are as upset as I am, but you know the, the powerlessness persists, right? And that 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 is hard to to deal with. I have to admit. Yeah. Wow, uh, so much that you just shared, uh, Ruben, and so much that I'm thinking about, including you know this somehow. I feel like Shakespeare lost its way. And, you know, you're one of only a few people who are kind of ushering Shakespeare back into this critical space, this critical kind of race space, but also ushering it at the same time back into popular culture, right? I, I, just remarkable. Um, tell me, what is the Espinosa trademark kind of approach method in the classroom? I imagine it's so exciting for your students. I, you know, thanks for saying that. I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know that they'd, they'd all agree, but I mean, I, I, I will tell you. I mean, it, it is, it is gone through different iterations over time, and I will readily own my mistakes at the onset. I mean, I think when I came into this profession, you know, selling Shakespeare was was relatively easy. Talking about his universality, right? How important he is, and then you know, being passionate about it, right? I think, uh, you know, I was able to bring a lot of students into it. Uh, certainly, they are eager to talk about gender. Uh, but, you know, as, as I moved along and, and my interests shifted a little bit, um, that has that has come to be, you know, something that I I thankfully no longer do. I don't start with, like, Shakespeare was born in, right? And to talk about it, it, it doesn't matter. I, I really begin with the question, why Shakespeare, right? Like, and, and for them to think about, like, this is a required course in your, if you're an English major, you have to take a course on Shakespeare. It's the only sole authored required course that they have to take you know, you know they, certainly they can take courses that are that are you know focusing on one author but those are typically special topics courses right and so my question is why Shakespeare and always there is like he's universal he you know transcends time all these answers from students right but asking them really to think about like how does he factor into their their own legacy right their own literary legacy and and this on the border has been interesting because many of them are quick to say you know, in a lot of ways, Cervantes would be more meaningful, right? And, and the question there is why, as Chicanex is, as bilingual students here, right? You're, you're substituting the language of one colonizer for the language of another colonizer, right? And so we, we've got to really interrogate 
those, you know, forms of colonization and try to get into a kind of, you know, uh, mindset of decolonizing, right? And so then that's when I bring in, so my, my approach has always been to bring in, you know, uh, excerpts from Arturo Islas, right? Toni Morrison engaging with Shakespeare, really thinking about contemporary writers uh, and artists, right, who draw on Shakespeare, uh, you know, but to tell their particular stories, right, that are, are meaningful. And in this way, they're thinking about their experiences. And a lot of my writing assignments are asking them to really focus on issues that are germane to our present moment, you know, whether they be, you know, you know child detention centers here, right? Uh, you know, when that was transpiring, the cartel violence in Juarez, when that was, you know, at, at its height. And I invite them to think about, you know, how, how their perspectives, you know, shape what I call the ongoing making of Shakespeare. Right? And so one assignment I have for them is they are, they, it's, it's a kind of uh, final assignment of the semester, but I, I introduced it at the start, so they're supposed to be working on it throughout the semester. And they have to film a rendition of a scene from Shakespeare uh, with a contemporary social issue in mind. Five minutes, they can adapt it as they see fit, and they can veer from the language as they see fit. And that was one uh, change I made when I first, you know, uh, started assigning this uh, to the present moment is you know, after the first couple of years, I always ask students for feedback and they said, on it, because I had them just adhere strictly to his language and they said, that is, that is difficult. And I, I, you know, I was doing what is done. Like I was being a gatekeeper, right? I was like, well, you've got to like, there's something you, you can't, you can't mess with that, right? You, that that's supposed to be sacrosanct. And that's not the case. And once I untethered them from the language, you know, some brilliant, brilliant productions came to the fore with some very honest kind of discussions about, you know, the issues that I'm invested in, you know, apprehensions about linguistic identity, feelings of alienation for our transfronterizos, right? Students who are crossing over from Juarez. And um, it, it leads, those moments lead, I think, to the important conversations that we should have, which, which are about race. And I want to make it clear. I mean, you, you mentioned I'm, I'm one of few and, and, and there, are, there are, thankfully, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I think that at some point, you know, it feels like Shakespeare lost its way, but that was, that was a concerted effort. I mean, the gatekeeping in Shakespeare is real. And so even in the 90s, when you had, great scholars like Joyce Green McDonald, you know, uh, Kim F. Hall, uh, Arthur Little, all focusing on race and Shakespeare. It felt like these kind of stutter steps because people were not really willing to embrace that as part of the dominant conversation about Shakespeare, right? That was being defined by the likes of Greenblatt, you know, and, and, and other Shapiro, you know, and, and other, which is great work, right? But it, it's, it's different. And I don't think it carries the same currency or meaning and thankfully, they committed to that. And Ayanna Thompson really, you know, was able to come in and mobilize. And I remember being, you know, part of a seminar that had a large body of auditors all committed to race and Shakespeare. And the invitation was made and saying, like, if we're going to do this, we have to do it collectively. And we have to work collectively to making sure that this becomes a kind of you know, not a niche field as they see it, right? But, but a, an important field. And, and it has, I think it's defining the way that we are moving and I'm excited about it. I'm excited to be part of that community. Um, but to this day, I mean, people sometimes think about race and shape and say in this emerging field, right? And, and that's because these are Shakespeareans. I, I, I get it, you know, if you're, not, if you're not, you know, a Shakespeare scholar, you know, that you would think this is an emerging field. But those who have been in the profession for, you know, 40 years and are calling it an emerging field, it feels like, you're paying attention to what you want to pay attention to here. Right? And you are very deliberately ignoring, right? What, what is, what has been part of this, you know, th throughout the process. And so it's exciting. I, I really do feel it's an exciting moment to be a Shakespearean because, you know, if, if, if you've seen, you know, Ayanna Thompson, you know, had, had the, the, the open letter was part of the open letter to the MLA here, right. Talking about gatekeeping and publishing. I mean, they really are challenging now what they know are the structures that define the way that, you know, certain scholarship is valued, right, versus other scholarship that is seen as maybe tolerated, right? And, and yeah, it's, it's I, I feel like, like, now is, is the time to certainly capitalize on this. So amazing, uh, Ruben, which leads me beautifully to where is the vitality in Latinx studies today from your side of the table? I mean, Frederick, so I, I will give you all credit here. You've been doing this for, for a long time and drawing attention to the importance of, of Latinx studies. I think for, for the reasons that we all know, the, the shifting demographic in the U.S., right, uh, but the continued devaluation of brown lives, right, uh, in our society, uh, the, the, the view 
of, of Spanish, right, seen as a deficit, right, as opposed to a, a kind of an asset for, for our students, for our communities, right? Uh, the, the outright hostility, right, to, to, to a Latinx presence in the U.S., when, you know, we, we know for a fact here, right, you know, the, the, the borders moved on us, right? You know, it, it, you know we, we were here long before many. And I think there's, there's importance in, in really trying to uh, foster that sense of confidence and identity, right, uh, for our students as they move forward. And, and I, I'll leave you, I, I think, with, with an anecdote, I think that, that, that uh, demonstrates this, you know, beautifully. It, it was the issue in Tucson, right, when, uh, you know, SB 1070 was passed and Dolores Huerta went to speak to the students at Tucson High School. And, you know, she told them very, very candidly, she said, you, you know, you, you, you have to be, you know, informed voters as you're coming to graduate and you're going to be because Republicans hate Latinos, she said, right? And, you know, the, the superintendent at that time who was a Republican was so incensed that she would say this to the students that he, he you know, he had his own aide go and tell the students <laughs> that Republicans don't in fact hate Latinos, right? And, and in a moment of resistance, they turned their backs on her and they raised their fists, right? Uh, and it, 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 was, it was a kind of wonderful moment of resistance, but what transpired there was a dismantling of the Mexican-American studies program at Tucson. And, and this, is, this is a point, um, you know, it, it People always assume that they, they banned the books and it really was a self-banning that took place because what the teachers did is, is they were forced through legislation that was passed that said they could not broach conversations about race or colonialism in their classes. They had to identify books that might lead to conversations about this because it, it wasn't a matter of the teachers bringing up the topic, but even if a student said, for example, they're studying the Tempest, right? And says like, well, Caliban strikes me as like somebody who could be, you know, uh, you know, a, a slave or somebody under colonial mindset, already they're in violation of the law. And so they had to go self-centered and they banned a lot of books. Most of them were by Chicanx authors, you know, Latinx authors. Shakespeare was there, right? Shakespeare's The Tempest was part of it. His cultural capital mattered so much that this made national news. They were like, you know, the banning of The Tempest, right, in, in Tucson. All of that aside, I think the study that was, you know, uh, conducted by the University of Arizona at that time demonstrated that the Mexican-American Studies program at Tucson meant higher graduation rates and higher college enrollment for Latinxes. To be clear, what, what those legislators wanted in Tucson was not necessarily caring about what kind of humanities-infused books were, you know, doing, but the success of those future voters here, right? And that is a continued, I think, devaluation of their worth, deliberate attempts to keep them, you know, uh, uh, kind of politic politically silent here, right? And, and really continue with this, you know... Um, a pattern, right, of, of, of creating roadblocks for Latinx success. So what's the value of Latinx studies? I, I do feel it's, it's a sense of, of confidence and, and belief in oneself that, that our students have, have to gain. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that because of that incident, you know, that, that list of books was adopted by so many school districts across the U.S., right, with uh, Libro Traficante, right, and Tony Diaz at the University of Houston who put that forward. So, um, if I could just even briefly harness the energies behind that to speak to Shakespeare studies, and I feel like I'm, I'm doing something. Wow, um, so powerful, so important. Ruben Espinosa, the uh, University of Texas, El Paso, thank you for your work. Thank you for your intervention for the Bard, borders, borderlands, Latinx culture, identities. Thank you, Ruben. Frederick, thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. It's great to see you. And thank you for the work you're doing. I mean, this, this is great. So I'm honored to be here. Thank you.